So we're going to go through a case. Is I, I have a lot of information on this slide, but we're going to kind of go fast um, because I think you know, this is going to be this type of presentation is going to be a picture's worth a thousand words. I like doing a lot of diagrams and action. So we'll get to that. We'll also be talking about the evidence behind what this is. So um, I have no financial conflicts of interest. I will be educating. For those that, when I mention Johns Hopkins, the first thing that happens to, uh, that I get a lot of the time, they say, I have somebody sometimes approach me and say, oh, I've been to Baltimore and, and so on and so forth. I wanted to explain, I am in Florida not Baltimore. So here's the image of Florida, you know, the United States and Florida has this little tail right here. Okay. Johns Hopkins is in Maryland right there on the top. I'm down here in Florida. So I get the best of both worlds because I get to be a, a, a member of the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, but I live at the beach in Florida. So anybody is welcome to come and enjoy the beach. Okay. Let's get to the presentation. So we have a case of a newborn here that's term, maternal labs are negative. We immediately have some respiratory distress in the delivery room and the baby is, in, is uh, intubated and admitted to the NICU. During the resuscitation, you notice that the baby has some meconium staining and actually some flex noted when you're looking and uh, going to intubate, you do notice some flex of meconium. So. Everybody's very smart here. I know you all know that this is meconium aspiration syndrome. We have respiratory distress. So this is where the syndrome comes uh, into play. You can look at the x-ray here as the baby is admitted, the baby's saturations are 78%. We obviously have respiratory uh, distress. We are already on 100% oxygen. And you can see the x-rays showing these opacities throughout the lungs. You can see the gas showing respiratory acidosis for the most part. You do have a slight metabolic acidosis as we sometimes find with these uh, cases. So this case initially of, of uh, meconium aspiration syndrome also has a subsequent diagnosis now of persistent pulmonary hypertension. So we're gonna do the outline of persistent pulmonary hypertension through an introduction. We'll talk about the pathophysiology of this. We'll talk a little bit about the management of pulmonary hypertension. And then what's the evidence behind the things that we do in the NICU? So first of all, what is the definition of pulmonary hypertension? It is an increase in the pulmonary pressures of greater than 25 millimeters of mercury. And it commonly pressures equivalent or greater than systemic blood pressure. It is clinically shown to have a bidirectional flow from right to left through the PDA. And you can actually see some retrograde high velocity through the tricuspid valve. This is the TR jet that the, uh, the cardiologists talk about. As far as the epidemiology, it is important to know that all babies have some relative pulmonary hypertension when they're born. So, it doesn't help you when you have a baby who has respiratory symptoms to get an immediate echocardiogram because every cardiologist is gonna read it as pulmonary hypertension. So you wanna make sure you use all your clinical signs. And then obviously if things are not improving or you wanna look at function of the heart, then you can get an echocardiogram. But I can assure you, I hear this all the time from our trainees where they say, can we get an echo? And I tell them, I don't need one the baby has pulmonary hypertension and I wave my hand on the baby. And I'll take the $350 for the echocardiogram. Um, most commonly, you see 50% of patients that, may, that have meconium aspiration syndrome will pre present with this. Keep it in mind that 10% of these babies have meconium fluid or meconium staining. 20% of these present secondary to a pneumonia or sepsis. 20% are idiopathic, meaning I have no idea. 5% from respiratory distress syndrome. And then less than 1% of these are actually congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So if there is a mother that comes and presents and she has no prenatal lapse, that's definitely one of the diagnoses you have to keep in mind as you're looking for this patient. And then actually persistent pulmonary hypertension really is not as common as we think, but it is found in about 0.1% of babies. <laughs> the mortality is... 1% to 50%, that's a huge range, but it really depends on what's the etiology of this. You can imagine if we're talking about a patient who has congenital diaphragmatic hernia, 
you're going to be closer to that 50% if it's born in the community somewhere, as opposed to, again, other, you know, if, if it's a pneumonia and you can treat that, that might be on the lower end. Without nitric oxide or sildenafil, the mortality can be up to 50%. This is why it's extremely important to be able to, in a situation like this, get these babies to a center where you can at least start your sildenafil if there is, you know, if you're in a hospital or in a country that doesn't use nitric oxide and definitely ECMO. So let's talk about the pathophysiology. So there are three effects of pulmonary hypertension. You can have a mechanical effect, and this basically has a changes in the, our violar structure, and I'll talk about that. You can have a physical effect that leads to this, and this is the change in blood flow. And then you also have a chemical effect, the changes of a biochemical components. And we're obviously gonna go through all three. From a mechanical change, if you have a patient who is ventilated and they have a low alveolar expansion, or basically you have a collapsed, you have atelectasis, this will actually put pressure on the blood vessels causing pulmonary hypertension. The subsequent um, can occur if you actually have over distension of the lung. So sometimes you will actually get an x-ray, you see that the baby's ribs are 10 or 11, or you are using very high pressures because of the concern of pulmonary hypertension. And what actually is causing is that those high pressures are actually pushing and putting pressure on the blood vessels, causing that pulmonary hypertension. So sometimes when the tidal volume is elevated, you actually want to bring that down a little bit. But I'll talk about that later. In utero, as the lung is not expanded, and obviously gravity takes some uh, part of this, you will see that this is the blood vessels in the lung. The apical part of the lung has very, very small, ar the, the arterioles uh, are small still because they haven't been opened by all the physiological things I'll talk about in a minute, while the lower part, because of gravity, is actually opened to a certain degree. So what actually happens prior is that you get a blood flow in maybe the lower parts of the alveoli, of the uh, lung. And when I say lower, obviously the babies are not standing up. So we think of the baby laying down, the lower part may actually be the posterior part. This is why evolutionarily, interestingly, when we were you know, walking, I'm quadrupedal, we were walking in our four uh, extremities, we actually had a better uh, um, oxygenation in the upper part, okay? And then when we became babies, we were put this way. This is why some of our babies, if you actually put them prone, they will oxygenate better because evolutionarily, they wanted the oxygen to be on their back, okay? But what happens when the baby starts crying? So there it is, the baby starts crying, and now you have opened up the blood vessels in the upper part, not only because of gravity, not only because of mechanisms of anatomical mechanisms, but also because of the physiological things I'll talk about next. And look, I'm not lying. So now the blood vessel will actually go to all these other areas. And you notice the velocity of the flow as well makes a difference. Because the blood vessels are greater in the lower part, uh, there is a there the, there is less radius or sorry I should say there's more diameter, so it's less restrictive. Therefore, you'll have higher blood flow faster uh, in the bottom areas than you will in the apical areas. There is a very very slight difference. Clinically, we don't see it. It doesn't make a big difference clinically. But what about the chemical changes? So again, in utero, you really don't you have very poor oxygenation, so the blood vessels are actually very constricted. Again, that baby takes a nice deep breath and you have oxygen and nitric oxide will actually enter the alveolus like so, and it will cause now vasodilation. Now let's actually look in a little bit more detail what's really going on in the physiology of the lung. So as I mentioned, you get nitric oxide enter from the alveolar space into the vascular space, and you get guanosine triphosphate or GTP will actually now change to cyclic GTP. And then you have phosphodiesterase, which is usually the one that breaks down that product, and it changes from cyclic GTP to GMP. I am so sorry if I'm bringing nightmares from medical school but we have to talk about this because it really does help you explain why we use some of the medications like milrinone, like sildenafil. Where is it actually acting? I will get to that later. 
these changes will actually is is uh, that um, breakdown effect is what causes the vasodilation when you go from cyclic GTP to cyclic GMP. Now, what about fetal circulation? In utero, as we know, the blood the blood vessels are there. Are certain you know you have your PFO, you have different areas. So what normally happens in utero is you have your blood vessel go through to the left ventricle and it travels normally like so. When the blood vessels come back, you have two options. You can either go like you normally go physiologically post utero, or you can actually have the blood vessels go to the right ventricle and then go through the PDA and travel down. What happens at birth? We have these changes, right? So again, I mentioned the baby starts crying, and you can actually now go through normal pathways. You go through the lungs and you go through that PDA down into the aorta. As the blood vessel comes, as the blood comes back, it then goes into the aorta. But what do we see in pulmonary hypertension? Pulmonary hypertension, in my opinion, and I keep saying it all the time, is not so much there is a road. How do we do that? We can increase the systemic blood pressure by using vasopressin, such as dopamine, epinephrine. Uh, you can also use vasopressin as well, but you do have to be careful with that. You can also get some vasopressin. You can decrease pulmonary vascular resistance using, obviously, always oxygen first, and then you have the benzoyl, nitric oxide, and maybe milburn. Talk about the evidence behind all that. So going back to our original uh, diagram, again, Left side of no problem. You go through the artery, you go through the aorta, no problem. But what we can do now is using base pressors, we can actually now cause a base constriction of the systemic blood vessel, therefore increasing the blood pressure. And so, relatively speaking, you are decreasing the blockage in the lung because you're not competing. Systemic blood pressure has gone up. And so, this obviously facilitates now the blood vessel, the, the, um, red blood cells to be able to go to both sides, the PDA, but also now into the pulmonary arteries. Okay, so continuing with this, with the chemical changes, we wanna make sure we wanna control homeostasis. We wanna keep everything as uh, normal and level as possible physiologically. So you can, you, if you have a lot of hydrogen ions, or acidosis, you wanna make sure you decrease that acidosis. You can do that with a pulmonary vasoconstrictor. If you have an elevated CO2, you can decrease that hypercarvia, uh, which, as we know, hypercarvia is also a vasoconstrictor. If you, you can use oxygen by, again, increasing your oxygen, although you do have to be careful. One thing I, I, I do sometimes at the bedside is I will not put the baby up to 100% because there are some animal studies that actually, if you go to 100%, you can actually induce pulmonary hypertension from the radicals, the oxygen radicals that actually will scavenge scavenger. So if you can get away, I usually tell the, you know, the, the, the bedside uh, folks to go ahead and go up to 95% at a maximum. Okay. Nitric oxide, osidenophil, again, those are extremely good vasodilators. We'll talk about that. And then milrinone, that is a relative pulmonary vasodilator. I say relative because it does actually decrease pulmonary vascular resistance, but it also decreases your systemic vascular resistance. So it depends on every baby whether which one is winning first, okay? But again, there is some evidence, and we'll talk about that next. So 
going from this standpoint, we'll, I'm going to run through this really quickly, but nitric oxide will enter the smooth muscle cell. You get your guanylate cyclase, your GTP becomes cyclic GMP, and we talked about that already. You get the vasodilation from that. Phosphodiesterase 5 will be the one that will break down your cyclic GMP, um, and so you can recycle that process. On the other side, you have arachidonic acid with cyclooxygenase 1, which is that enzyme that will make, take it to prostaglandin, prostacycline, I'm sorry, and then you get adenylate cyclase, doing that ATP to cyclic AMP to vasodilation. And again, phosphodiesterase 3 now is the one that breaks down cyclic AMP back through 5-GMP. Um, actually, that's a typo there. It should be AMP. Mm -hmm. um, and these are important. Why? Because these phosphodiesterases are where sildenafil and where milrinone actually act. A really easy, easy way to remember where do they act? Because I always get asked, asked the question, milrinone, is milrinone phosphodiesterase 5? Is it phosphodiesterase 3? I will teach you now an easy way to remember is milrinone has an M that actually looks like a 3 if you turn it around. Okay, so now you remember that milrinone acts on three. And also, another way to look at it is sildenafil, the S looks like a five. So you remember that is phosphodiesterase. Now, how do you remember if it's AMP or GMP? All right, so the easy way to remember that is that milrinone, actually, the M comes before S, like three comes before five. So now you will remember that milrinone acts on three, and because M become, becomes before five, it acts on uh, phosphodiesterase, um, uh, sorry, acts on GMP, okay? AMP, I'm sorry, I looked, at, I looked at that thing wrong. AMP, right? Because M comes before S, like A comes before G. Okay. All right, so continuing with this case, so the infant, unfortunately, continued to have low oxygen, and you're trying to decide whether you should continue whether you should give surfactant for these type of babies. And then again, we talked about sildenafil, nitric oxide, and milrinone. What is the evidence behind these things? So we're gonna go quickly through this. So we talked about these four, and obviously always, always start with oxygen. Uh, believe it or not, oxygen is a greater vasodilator than nitric oxide. We always think nitric oxide is because you're going there already, but it's usually because your oxygen is already up, okay? But oxygen is a more potent vasodilator. Okay, so what does the evidence say for surfactant? So when you look at respiratory distress and the use of surfactant to avoid ECMO in babies that have meconium aspiration syndrome, you can see the forest plot shows that it favors the use of surfactant for meconium aspiration syndrome to avoid the use of ECMO. Uh, what about, you know, does it uh, cause any issues? Like, for example, one of the concerns is, does given surfactant in these babies because they might be air trapping because of the meconium aspiration, does it elevate the risk of pneumothorax? The evidence shows no. Okay, when, you know, when you're using these things, what are the three effects? Pulmonary hypertension, sepsis, and meconium aspiration syndrome. Surfactant is the most effective for meconium aspiration syndrome. Secondary for sepsis. For pulmonary hypertension, <clears throat> For other reasons, it really has very little effect. And this, as we, as, we, as we know, is probably due to the surfactant inactivation that happens from meconium. Now let's talk about sildenafil. And again, everybody knows the evidence. We've been using sildenafil for a long time now. But sildenafil actually does increase PaO2 during pulmonary hypertension. One little tip, everybody is worried always about PaO2 in pulmonary hypertension. And you go down on your oxygen, you're on, let's say, 95%. You go down on your oxygen. You had a PaO2 of maybe 110. You go down on your oxygen, and then your PaO2 now goes down to 80. And people always get concerned. They go back up on their oxygen. One thing to keep in mind, in these babies, you have open shunts. You have a PDA, and you have a PFO. PaO2s are just tiny oxygen bubbles. If you look at the formula for oxygen content, right, is 1.36 you know, times FiO2 times your hemoglobin molecule plus 0 0.00003 PaO2. That's how little PaO2 really matters, okay? And physiologically, those bubbles are crossing all the time. 
So when you go down on your oxygen and your PaO2 drops, all it means is that a bubble just crossed over to the other side. It tells you nothing about your management. You already know. The only thing you need to know is if you drop and your lactate goes up, then you have dropped your, your, car your cardiac output, okay? If your SATs have dropped, then you have dropped the ability to reach that, that hemoglobin molecule and saturate that. So PAO2s do not really help you in the management. It only tells you how bad is your pulmonary hypertension, okay? All right, we know the, the oxygen index. This is the formula. So again, sildenafil does decrease oxygen index in pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then it also, for all-cause mortality, it also decreases the all-cause mortality. And again, we know this evidence. We know sildenafil really works. And then what about nitric oxide? So when using nitric oxide, you can see that it actually does decrease in comparison to the control, which would be acetylcholine. You can see that using nitric oxide does decrease the pulmonary vascular resistance, again, in comparison to the control. What about nitric oxide? 30 to 60 minutes later, it also improves oxygenation dramatically. Again, we know this evidence. I'm just showing you this um, so that you have this uh, clear in your mind. Uh, it also decreases the need for ECMO. So if we're looking at whether to start nitric oxide for a patient who may be going to ECMO, this is 100% what you want to do. Okay. It also decreases the combined mortality and ECMO. So it's not only just will this baby go to ECMO, but it also decreases the mortality. All right, now the one everybody really wants to know is milrinone. Is there evidence for the use of milrinone? So there really, there's not a lot of big studies, but we do have a couple of studies uh, from Ayman et al. Did a randomized control trial of sildenafil versus milrinone. Again, this is in a resource limited country, so they don't have the ability to do nitric oxide or ECMO, okay? There were two groups, again, small study, unfortunately, but there was a group of using sildenafil with that dose or using milrinone at that dose. And what it showed was the pulmonary artery pressures were lower and also the oxygen index was lower in both groups, but the milrinone had the greatest decrease in oxygen index, okay? Versus just using sildenafil, okay? But this is another interesting one from this is El Gendur in 2020. It's also a randomized trial, but this is the using now milrinone plus sildenafil. So we know, again, if you just use one, yeah, it might be some improvement. But what about using both of them? Because I think this is more akin to our standard practice, right? And so this is three groups. Again, unfortunately, small study. But this is three groups using the sildenafil, milrinone, and then the combined. Also showed that there was a decrease in pulmonary artery pressures and also the oxygen in the combined group for both. The ox the, in the combined group, it decreased. And this was definitely statistically and clinically significant. Okay, the caveat again is that these are small studies. We do need larger studies for us to be able to do this because we have some anecdotal, you know, for some patients you start this and unfortunately they can get blood pressure drops, then they're starting on inotropes and that can propagate. So there are cases of that. So we need larger studies to determine whether this should be done for as a standard practice all over the world. So in conclusion, pulmonary, uh, pulmonary hypertension is not an echo response, it is a clinical response. It is what you see in the patient. Meconium aspiration syndrome is the most common reason for pulmonary hypertension. The factors include a mechanical, physical, and biological. The management on a ventilator standpoint, you always wanna stay between that four to six. You wanna increase the blood flow to the pulmonary artery using the tricks I talked about, and you wanna decrease the pulmonary vascular resistance using the medications we already talked about. Nitric oxide has definitely been shown to decrease the use of ECMO in pulmonary hypertension. Surfactant definitely works, especially with meconium aspiration syndrome. Sildenafil decreases the oxygen index and mortality, we know that. And then again, although milrinone can be used, and is often used, you want to make sure you use that judiciously and watch how the patient develops. If you're having hypotension, you may want to start slow on that patient. If you're going to be starting, you might want to start maybe at 0.25, then move up to 0.5 if you're using your mirror node. And as we know, we go up to 0.75. We're still in the research uh, looking at whether we use bosentin, which is an endothelial receptor antagonist, or triprostanil, prostacycline and analog. We're actually doing both studies uh, in our center at, at Johns Hopkins Old Children. So hopefully we'll have some results. Recruitment is really, really slow because 
these, these uh, meds are usually used for severe pulmonary hypertension and they're bordering ECMO. So a lot of the times uh, the clinicians will say, no, 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 I don't wanna start that. Let, let's go to ECMO. So it's, it's been really hard to recruit for, these, pay, for these, uh, these studies. Okay, as always, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. This is why we do what we do in neonatology. We get these babies that are small and we get them to go home so the families can enjoy them. Thank you again for your time, appreciate it.